Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and let me um, say how delighted I am to be here again. Um, I haven't met all of you. My name is Alistair McGrath. And in these lectures I've been giving um, throughout this year, I've been trying to open up some interesting and important questions which have an obvious religious or theological dimension, but which also have a much wider cultural and scientific relevance. And in each case, I've been trying to identify someone to interact with, a voice which is not my own, but nevertheless who opens up very interesting questions or ways of thinking and interact with them. And that's what we'll be doing this afternoon. As you can see, we're going to be looking at um, Philip Pullman to help us open up some very interesting questions, focusing on a very important issue, which is what makes us distinct as human beings? I'm going to explore this question in a number of ways, but Philip Pullman will be a very interesting dialogue partner. Now, before I go any further, I, I need to apologize to you. I've got some form of hay fever, and this means that my voice will probably get very croaky and quite, um, quite soft at certain points, so I will have to um, make use of lots of water. So I do apologize for that. I'm hopeful we'll get through without too much difficulty. So let's begin. Here is the point I'm going to make. We live in a universe that is made up of what we might loosely call matter. And, you know, our bodies, my body, your bodies, are also made up of the same matter. Yet the issue really is, is that good enough to tell us what is distinct about us? How do we as human beings relate to this material universe. In one sense, we're part of it. And yet in another sense, we stand apart from it. One reason being that we think about this universe and try to understand our place within it. So what we need to try and do is work out how we understand ourselves to exist in this universe, yes, as material beings, which we are, and as more than that. What is this more that gives human beings this distinct identity? And you will know that many philosophical and indeed religious writers argue that humanity consists of a material body, but what gives us distinctiveness is some kind of eternal spiritual soul. And I'll look at this idea in the course of this lecture. But let's begin by looking at an experiment. And this is an experiment done back in 1907 by Dr. Duncan McDougall in Massachusetts. And this is a really interesting experiment. I mean, it is now regarded as absolute rubbish. But I, as you can see from this newspaper article in New York Times, it really was taken very seriously for a while. McDougall weighed patients who were dying of tuberculosis, and he reported a strange and sudden weight loss at the moment of death in four cases. And he asked, what explains this weight loss? And his answer? Well, it's about the departure of the soul from the body. Well, as you can see, that certainly um, got people interested. In fact, he said, we can, do, we can do more than that. We can tell you roughly how much the soul weighs. And for those of you who are interested, it's between half and a full ounce. <laughs> now, McDougall's experiment received a lot of attention, see the New York Times, um, and some media reports even converted this figure to the metric system. The soul weighed 21 grams. Now, I want you to remember that because when you go home, I suggest you enter that phrase 21 grams in an internet search engine. And you will be astonished at the amount of stuff that comes up. Because th this, this experiment lingers on in the popular imagination. For example, it makes an appearance in Dan Brown's novel, The Lost Symbol. Now, I mean, I, I've hinted already this experiment is now not really taken very seriously. But here's why I think it's important. It's a telling indicator of the continuing influence or the, the pervasiveness of the idea of some kind of immortal soul which is trapped within the human body and is only able to escape at death. In other words, our Physical, our material bodies are like a prism, in effect, entrapping the immortal soul. And when we finally die, the soul is able to, to go home. And it's actually a very influential idea. You find it in Plato. You find it in a number of Greek writers. And some of you may know the Greek phrase, sormosema, which means the body is a prison. And it's really getting at this kind of idea. It's not actually a particularly religious idea. It really 
began in Greek philosophy. But I'm going to explore this idea in more detail, try and ask where it came from, what sort of ideas it opens up, and how we might respond to it. Now, as many of you will know, modern neuroscience really finds the idea of a soul understood as some distinct, um, non-physical part of the human body to be very difficult. But I think I need also to say that the idea isn't really there in, for example, the Christian Bible. Um, this, what's sometimes called soul-body dualism, certainly has real cultural traction. It's, it's something that people find actually very helpful. It makes a lot of sense. That doesn't necessarily, of course, make it right. But certainly people find this very helpful as a way of organizing experience and actually helping them to identify what makes a body living and how that distinguishes it from a dead body. And you might think of the Genesis creation account, which talks about God breathing into an inanimate body and thus bringing it to life. And you can see here this, this very characteristic human attempt to try and make some sense of something very, very significant. Here is a human body, it's living, and then a few moments later, here is the same human body, it's dead. What is the difference? And that's a very important question for a lot of people. Now, the word soul, as you probably all know, is an Anglo-Saxon word. And actually, it really has the more general sense of life for a living being. And you find, for example, this, this, this idea in the Hebrew Bible as well, where again, the word nepesh, which we often translate as soul, really means a living being. I think that's an important point to, to, to bring out, because very often we think because a word soul is used, as used in precisely the sense which we would understand it today. Whereas very often, of course, it's being used in an older sense, where soul is simply an equivalent for something that, that, that brings a person to life. And likewise, if you look at the New Testament, uh, you, you know, it, very often you'll find, um, for example, St. Paul talking about uh, the flesh and the body or something like that. And he's not really saying there is this part of the human body which is called flesh. There is this part of the human body which is called spirit. It's much more there is an aspect of human existence which is fleshly, which in effect brings us down to the level of the world, and a different aspect of human nature which in effect makes us alive to more spiritual things. But all of these ideas, of course, have fed into this discussion about the human identity. We are made of matter, but the important point I want to emphasize is that we are still able to live in certain ways that transcend our material origins. So what is this matter that we're talking about? And the word has been used a lot in Western thought. Um, for example, Aristotle uh, makes a very famous distinction between matter and form. Matter is kind of the amorphous stuff out of which things are made. And then form is a distinct identity given by a process of, for example, manufacture or artistic production, which in effect brings about something that is new. And of course, Aristotle there is really saying that matter is of fundamental importance. But there were others, such as Epidopolis, who preferred to talk about four basic elements in our world, earth, water, air, and fire. And many of you will be familiar with those because, of course, you still find these ideas in various um, New Age movements or indeed various forms of neo-paganism. For most people today, the word element just means something that can't be broken down into any simpler chemical substances like hydrogen, oxygen, or carbon. But although my first degree is in chemistry, I'm not going to give you a lecture on chemistry. I want to hasten to reassure you. What I want to do is really focus on this really important question, which is what is our relationship as human beings to our physical world? And one area I will be opening up, which I think is quite helpful, is to say that whatever human beings are, okay, whatever we are, we seem to have this inbuilt capacity to relate to our world in different ways. In other words, we're able to define the way in which we relate to the material world. We say, yes, we are made up of this material, this matter, but nevertheless, there is something different about us which means that we rise above it or we stand above it.
And obviously, this, this raises lots of questions, but the one I'm going to look at particularly today is whether we think of our material world as something that is evil, or something that's neutral, or something that's good. In other words, do we see ourselves as good people in a bad world? Or how do we begin to think about these kind of ideas? And you remember in earlier lectures, I looked at people like Dorothy L. Sayers or J.R. Tolkien. And today I want to look at Philip Pullman, who has opened up some fascinating discussions about our place in this world using the idea of dust as a key metaphor. And I'll be coming back to that idea later. So let's just pick up that phrase, dust. Many of you will know it from the Genesis creation narrative, which talks about human beings being formed, I quote, from the dust of the ground. And some of you may know the words of traditional Christian funeral services, which very often um, include this phrase, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So let's, let's begin by making a point that I think is a helpful starting point. We agree with something I think is very obvious, but it's only a starting point. And that is to say that we as human beings are indeed made up of the elements of our universe. Now, some would interpret this to mean that we are nothing but the matter of this universe. We are nothing but atoms and molecules. I want to begin by, by agreeing with that statement to the extent that each of us is indeed made up of atoms and molecules. But I think I'd want to raise a protest against the insertion of those words, nothing but. Because although we're made of these physical constituents, we're clearly more than that. Now, as you can see, I have this glass of water, which I'm going to be using in a moment. Um, but, you know, we can agree this glass of water is also made up of atoms and molecules. But I want to suggest to you that you and I, although sharing that chemical identity to some extent, are much more than that. That in effect, if you say that we are simply made up of atoms and molecules and that's it, we don't have a framework that helps us answer the question, what distinguishes us from, for example, this glass of water? Now, there are many who would argue that Human beings have an identity which can be reduced, for example, to our physical components, or perhaps our biological components. Now, this is Francis Crick, uh, his book, uh, The Astonishing Hypothesis, which came out in 1994. And many of you will know this quote because it actually does the rounds on the internet, and you very often see it in newspaper articles. And Crick is, in effect, reducing our significance to being a pack of neurons. Let me read this to you. You, in other words, um, are distinct identities. Your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are, in fact, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're nothing but a pack of neurons. And some of you will remember there's an allusion there to Alice in Wonderland. You're nothing but a pack of cards. My problem with this is, in effect, Crick seems to be saying that when you look at a complicated system like each of us, that you can simply say the system is nothing more than the sum of its parts. In other words, there are these different bits, and those define who we are. And the question I would have is, yes, we have these bits, but what happens if when these bits come together, something greater emerges from them? And many of you will know the word emergence, emergence. It's being used a lot in philosophy and certain kinds of science at the moment to try and explain the idea that when you get something that's complicated underway, the system begins to develop properties and possibilities which weren't there in the case of the original elements or constituents. In other words, when things come together and combine and form a system, things begin to happen which could not have happened at the level of the individual components. So I think there is a real issue there. Now, lots of people protest against such reductionist accounts of human beings. I certainly do. I, I could raise a number of objections, and some of those certainly would be theological or religious. But I need to make the point that many of those who protest against this 
form of reductionism are atheist scientists who are deeply concerned about the inadequacy of this kind of approach. And some of you will have read Raymond Tallis. If you haven't, it's a name worth noting. This is a quote from his book, Aping Mankind, which is a very good and very critical account of the way in which Darwin's theories of evolution have kind of way been overinterpreted in popular culture. But here he's saying something which I think is really quite important. He writes, I am an atheist humanist, but this does not oblige me to deny what is staring me in the face, namely that we are different from other animals and that we are not just pieces of matter. So I think there's an important point being made here. And in many ways, the issue is how we begin to unpack this question about what is more about us. In other words, we are more than just atoms and molecules. We are more than just metabolic processes. What is this more that we are talking about? And my concern about, for example, Francis Crick is he's simply saying you're, you're, you, you have these properties and this one is what defines you as a human being. But let's come back to that point I made earlier about what I called emergence. And science rightly uses reductionist approaches to try and make sense of complicated systems. And the idea, if you take something that's really complicated, like a human being, or indeed a, a biological ecosystem, you can begin to understand it by breaking it down into its constituent parts. In other words, you can say, well, we can look, for example, at the digestive system, at the reproductive system, at, you know, you list all the ones you want to look at. And that is helpful because it begins to give you an understanding how various components of the human body actually work. And that's good. And in that sense, science is right to use this reduction approach because it's breaking something complicated down into manageable segments. But here is the problem. When you put these manageable segments back together again, you find things happening which actually transcend the capacity of each of those bits. And that's why this idea of emergence is so important. If you want to be more precise about this, what emergence is about is this idea that a biological system, for example, develops properties at higher levels that you could not predict by knowing how the lower levels worked. In other words, you, you can say, well, we understand how certain basic elements work, but then when we look at higher elements, see things happening that we wouldn't have predicted on the basis of our knowledge of the lower levels. So what I'm saying to you is that science is right to try and reduce, but it has to also be aware that sometimes things happen which could not be predicted from knowing how individual components of a complicated system could work. So what I'm saying is that reductive accounts of human nature are helpful. They help us to work out what our various components are. But there is more to us than that. We can talk about this in terms of emergence. You can use a whole series of ways of thinking about this. But the basic point is that the recognition of the materiality of human beings does not mean we're on the same level as glasses of water, or simply atoms and molecules. So we can begin, I think, to give a good account of how we both are matter and yet transcend matter. But here's the next question I want to look at. What is our relationship with the material world? And I mentioned earlier this, this possibility of you know, the world being evil, the world being neutral, the world being good. And that's a very simplistic way of categorizing this, but it's just, it's just to try and help you see what the issue is. How do I, how do you think about our relationship with the world? Is the world something that might pull us down or something that might help us to elevate ourselves? And when we begin to ask these questions, we come across a group of philosophies or religious ideas that are very often described as forms of dualism dualism. And very often these take the form that there is a material world which is bad, 
and that then there is something else, perhaps a spiritual world, which is good, and that we as human beings are caught up in this, that our material bodies hold us back, but the spirit within us, in effect, raises us up. And so the question is, how do we avoid being contaminated? That language is very often used by the material world in which we exist. Now, many of you will recognize this and wonder where do these ideas come from? And it's not really a Christian way of thinking. Mainline Christianity has consistently held that matter isn't intrinsically evil. It's God's good, God's good creation, which may have gone wrong, but it's susceptible to restoration and to renewal. And a very common theme developed by theologians like Irenaeus of Leons in the second century is that the idea of the incarnation, which for Christians is a God chose to enter this material order and inhabit us, it as one of us, is actually a telling indication that matter is not something evil. It's something that is capable of being transformed and used by God. So there is something there. Now, let me agree immediately. There are some people on the fringes of Christianity. You might think of the medieval movement known as the Cathars uh, in some parts of northern Italy and southern France between 12th and 14th centuries who did think in this way. But really, we're looking back to the movement that's called Gnosticism. Many of you will know that word, Gnosticism, which comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. I'm going to look at one or two of the ideas of this approach, and then we'll take a little bit further as we begin to interact with Philip Pullman. But let me just be cautious here, that very often we say there is this movement called Gnosticism, and we think that in saying that, we're talking about something that's very well defined, that it actually is something which is well understood. And the reality is a bit more complicated. Uh, there's this broad movement which has certain points of convergence, but there are different kinds of Gnosticism. And so many scholars would say, that actually, you need to be very careful about using this words because it, it conveys the impression it's a very coherent, almost like um, homogeneous system, whereas in fact it's not. It's rather more complicated than that. But certainly there is one theme that emerges within many form of Gnosticism, and it's this, that the world, the cosmos, to use the word that they prefer, is not the result of a benevolent, beneficent God, but is rather the work of an evil or ignorant creator, that the world was formed imperfectly, that the world itself has evil characteristics, and that salvation is a process in which a different God tries to sort out the mess. So if you try and get this idea in your minds, it's very much about one God, an inadequate God, described by writers like Plato as the demiurge, a word that basically means something like an artisan, that this inadequate God makes the world badly. That's why we see evil and so on. And then another God, a good God, comes along and tries to restore the world to what it was meant to be. And that's a very interesting framework. Because basically it, is, it helps us understand one key element of a Gnostic worldview, which is that there is some divine spark within us, which in effect tells us that we don't really belong here. And that if only we knew how to, we could escape from this entrapping body and indeed from this evil universe. So it's a very interesting idea. And obviously one of the questions is, where does this kind of thinking take us? Certainly what Gnosticism is saying is that matter is evil. And the only way of purifying ourselves, the only way of finding salvation is to get out of this world into a spiritual realm, which is where we really are meant to be. And Gnosticism comes from this Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. And some of you will be saying, well, what kind of knowledge are we talking about? 
Is it a kind of, you know, a knowledge of the history of the world or, or what? Well, for Gnosticism, it's an esoteric knowledge. For some forms of Gnosticism, this is about knowing the cosmic passwords. So you can get out of this prison and then get past the various border checks as you try to make your way home to where you really belong. So it is quite like Dan Brown in many ways. It has that kind of mystique, that kind of sense of um, an initiated few knowing the secrets that will allow them to return home safely. And certainly various forms of Gnosticism, in effect, paralleled Christian ideas. You know, for example, the idea of salvation, the idea of a savior and so on, but they nevertheless interpreted these in quite different ways. For Gnosticism, Human beings have fallen into an evil and corrupt world by mistake. And one of the phrases you'll find in many Gnostic writers is this, we are gold in the mud. Gold in the mud. In other words, there is this evil universe, and we are in it. But we are like gold. We stand out. We are different. We don't really belong there at all. We belong somewhere else and we need to get out of this place into where we are meant to be. Now, clearly, Gnosticism was highly influential in its time. And indeed, there are many movements today that some sociologists would say are Gnostic in their shape. And what I want to emphasize is that actually the core ideas of Gnosticism do parallel other ways of thinking. Here's a quote from G.K. Chesterton, who is not a Gnostic, but nevertheless articulates a thought which certainly is there in Gnosticism and is certainly there in Christianity, but they interpret it in very different ways. And Chesterton is a very elegant writer, and I hope you'll like his turn of phrase. We have come to the wrong star. This is what makes life at once so splendid and so strange. The true happiness is that we don't fit. We came from somewhere else. We have lost our way. And that thought actually is very, very significant because you know, many people will, will look around themselves and say, well, you know, there has to be more than life, to life than this. There has to be a better place in this world that we know. And Chesterton there is trying to frame that idea and do something with it. So Chesterton's interesting, but I think it's time to move on to Philip Pullman. And let, let's go back to Pullman by picking up on that phrase in Genesis' creation narrative that I noticed a little bit earlier. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. And in his Dark Materials trilogy, and Pullman makes extensive use of this category of dust to explore some major questions about human existence, including, for example, the nature of goodness, human freedom, and I think for Pullman particularly, the relationship of innocence and experience. And again, I, I'm not going to criticize Pullman. I disagree with him at certain points, as you can imagine, but I wanted to use him as a very interesting way of opening up some of the questions that we've been thinking about. And I'm sure many of you will know there are media reports that he'll be developing the idea of dust further in a series of future works. So let's begin by asking this question. What does Pullman mean by this word dust? And what is the significance of this idea? And there have been a number of scholarly writers who, who've tried to unpack um, what Pullman means by this. Um, the writer I'm going to use is Anne-Marie Bird, B-I-R-D, and much of her work is available on the internet if any of you want to follow through on this. And most writers looking at the, Pullman's use of the word dust have emphasized the ambiguity of the word. In other words, it serves to use Bird's phrase as an all-inclusive, multifunctional metaphor. Um, in other words, it, 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 it has, is not limited to one particular meaning. It seems to have different meanings. And actually, as we work our way through the Dark Materials trilogy, we find one aspect emphasized in the first volume, a different aspect in the second, and a different in the third. And uh, one scholar suggested that um, we must talk about the intrinsic amorphousness of dust. 
very scholarly phrase, I think. So let's look at how Pullman begins to develop this idea. So let's look at the first volume in the trilogy, which is published in the United Kingdom as Northern Lights and in North America as The Golden Compass. And in this book, dust is described, I quote, as a new kind of elementary particle. Now, I'm not quite clear how that helps us grasp its essential character, because you know, what we think of scientifically as elementary particles are not generally thought to have great moral or spiritual implications. But perhaps its significance is captured a little bit more expansively in the suggestion that it might function as some kind of metaphor for the idea of original sin. And Pullman himself um, uh, makes his central character, Lyra, think of dust in terms of, I quote, dark intentions, like the forms of thoughts not yet born. Let me read that again. It's a nice phrase. Um, thinking of dust as, quote, dark intentions, like the forms of thoughts not yet born. In other words, there's something there, not yet actualized, but which something could catalyze and make this, this intention into an action. I'll come back to that. Then we come to the second volume in the series, The Subtle Knife. And this tends to refer to dust primarily as the actual physical substance that holds the universe together, brimming with possibilities. And dust, for Pullman, has the potential to become all manner of things, which defy easy classification. It's also, I think this is a very important point, a symbol of the essential interconnectedness of all things within our universe which suggests that the seeming inconsistencies or diversities of the world actually can be seen to be linked together. These are the appearances, but beneath them, there is something that, in effect, guarantees their coherence and their unity. And I think Pullman is there perhaps making the point that, um, that very often people interpret the universe in seemingly incompatible ways. But that is about human interpretations of the universe. And maybe this use of the word dust gets across the idea that the universe itself has a deeper unity that maybe human beings don't adequately appreciate. Now, I'm sympathetic to that point, but I'm not quite sure how far it takes us. I mean, it does, I think, give us some very helpful perspectives. And if I could give you another thought, which I think supplements this, Every living creature in our universe, including me and including you, is made up from the elements of the universe, most of which were created in the cores of stars, in which the process of what's called stellar nucleosynthesis created the heavier elements essential to life, like um, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, because the Big Bang only created hydrogen, helium, and lithium, which don't do anything for life at all. And so there's a sense in which all of us are the products or the outcomes of stardust. That's a very nice thought. So we could think of ourselves being held together or interconnected by our common origin in the cores of stars. And again, it's a helpful thought, it's a nice thought. But again, I'm not quite sure how far that takes us. So we come to the third volume in the trilogy, The Amber Spyglass. And here we find uh, what I think is a really interesting thought. And I'm going to talk quite a lot about this because it seems to me this opens up lots of good ideas. In the third volume of the trilogy, dust seems to function as self-conscious matter with a capacity for catalyzing the emergence of consciousness in basically, material beings. Now, that leads us to a point that is very important for Pullman, which is, in effect, a transition from, if you like, a state of innocence and a state of experience and maturity. And for Pullman, that transition is really important. 
And Pullman is very critical of any who try to freeze human beings in a state of innocence and not allow them to go on and develop experience and maturity. And Pullman portrays the magisterium, which I take to be a character of the Catholic Church, as wanting to petrify a child's development in a pre-sexual phase. Here's how Anne-Marie Bird describes this aspect of um, Pullman's thought. I quote, To the church, then, dust symbolizes the awakening of sexual awareness, humanity's rejection of the heavenly for the earthly, and thus a descent from spirit to matter. And so I think Pullman is offering a critique of notions of sin that he sees as being bound up with human physicality. Because we are material creatures, because we are physical beings, that in some way determines that we are sinful. And Pullman is saying that, that is not adequate in the current human nature. We need something better than that. And actually, I, I would agree with him on that point. I think there's a lot more that does need to be said. Uh, for me, the way Pullman portrays the magisterium here is more Gnostic than Christian. I mean, for example, at one point he talks about the magisterium being both material and sinful. That, that seems to be more of a Gnostic idea. But I think there is a real issue here to be looked at. And certainly, if we look at, for example, the Christian writer Augustine of Hippo, Augustine, as some of you will know, rejected a movement called Manichaeism, um, which is a form of Gnosticism in order to embrace Christianity. And this meant Augustine was forced to think about questions of sexuality. And for Augustine, one of the key questions, and you'll recognize this as having an obvious affinity with Pullman, is how do we affirm the utility and the wonder of sexual attraction without allowing it to overwhelm us and thus become the cause of our own dehumanization, or how might it stop us from, in effect, exploiting the sexuality of others who can so easily be treated as objects of sexual gratification? And Augustine wrestles with this one. How can, in effect, we say that, that human sexuality is a good thing, while at the same time recognizing that, that like all good things, this can go wrong? So it's a very interesting question. I mean, to give a personal reflection here, I mean, I have to say I am disturbed by what I see as the cultural manipulation of sexual awareness in our own day, but I'm not really sure what I can do about that. But going back to Pullman, Pullman's point here is that dust is creative. It's something that injects intellectual energy into mere matter. In other words, it's about, look, there is matter inert, and something is added to this. And as a result, it becomes living and thinking. In other words, it has capacities which transcend its origins. And Pullman sees this particularly important in uh, the transition of a child's development towards adulthood. And he writes these words in the amber spyglass. And I think they're quite important words. Um, what he's doing is thinking about what would happen if we were simply material objects. Okay, that, that's, what, that's what he's reflecting about. So listen to what he says. I think he's right. I think it's nicely phrased. Thought, imagination, feeling would all wither and blow away, leaving nothing but a brute automatism. I'll read that again. again. His point is, if we are just material objects, then thought, imagination, feeling <coughs> would all wither and blow away, leaving nothing but a brute automatism. So you can see immediately that Pullman is using this word dust not to mean simply materials, but to mean materials with the capacity to energize, to bring life, to vivify. And he's trying to, in fact, help us to see that talking about a universe that's made of dust does not mean it is a purely material universe in that there are possibilities open to us which transcend those material origins. 
and Pullman does not see dust as entailing any kind of physical reductionism. Rather, it catalyzes the emergence of those higher functions that we regard as being characteristic of flourishing human beings. And that seems to me to be very important indeed. And as I think you will know, um, we need to be a little bit careful here because there is now a large research literature that suggests that some animals may share at least some of these areas of thought and feeling. But I think Pullman's point stands nonetheless that thought, imagination, and feeling are all things that are to be affirmed, and any movement that seeks to suppress them is clearly to be resisted. And certainly for me, a kind of crude reductionism, we are nothing but atoms and molecules, fails to do a justice to what is both essential to and characteristic of human identity. Now, Pullman, I think, suggests that this kind of suppressive agenda is linked specifically with the church. But I think I, I would say that while I'm sure he's right at some points here, that actually many institutions, political and social, actually run exactly the same risk. So, as I've tried to indicate, Pullman uses this word dust in a very broad and wide-ranging fashion, almost as a metaphor for the fundamental unity of the universe, which ought to elicit a corresponding unity on the part of its human observers and interpreters. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there, but there is another aspect of Pullman that I think is particularly interesting, and that is Pullman's own creation myth, which he proposes as an alternative to others, such as, for example, that of Christianity. And there is a very interesting um, conversation between Philip Pullman and Rowan Williams that took place um, back in 2004, and you can easily access this online. It's there in the Daily Telegraph, and there's a lot, a lot of food for thought there. But here is Pullman talking about his own creation myth. He writes, and then he puts it on the screen so you can see it, in the sort of creation myth that underlies his dark materials, which is never fully explicit, which I was discovering as I was writing it, the notion is that there never was a creator. Instead, there was matter, and this matter gradually became conscious of itself and developed dust. So dust, not simply as matter, but as conscious matter. Then he goes on like this. Dust sort of precedes. That, that is how the newspaper article reads. Um, it's a typo. should be proceeds from matter as a way of understanding itself. Then he comes to this interesting point, which I'm going to explain in a moment. I'll read it, then explain. The authority, capital A, was the first figure that condensed, as it were, in this way. And from then on, he was the oldest, the most powerful, the most authoritative. So what is Pullman getting at here? Well, he's talking about this idea of the condensation of matter. And it's a, a, a reworking of the idea of creation. And he is suggesting that this led to the production of multiple, well, almost angels, sort of spiritual beings. But what I want you to notice is his use of the word authority. He argues that the condensation of dust leads to the production of these figures and that the first of these is the authority, and then others follow. So the key point I want you to understand is there is this process of production which leads to what Pullman calls the authority, and then to other creatures of this kind. And Pullman's argument in this creation myth is that the authority, being the first of these, realized that he, I think the gender is appropriate, he could present himself as being the creator in that he was existent before any of the other figures emerged. In other words, there is no creation. There is no creator, but there was one who was the first to be produced, and this first figure to be produced claimed the spurious authority and function as creator. <clears throat> 
So the key point that Pullman is making is that in his creation myth, God is an outcome of dust, yet an outcome which um, mistakenly came to be seen as having priority and authority by those who subsequently emerged. And initially this deception worked, then other angels began to question this, resulting into, in a cosmic re rebellion. And some of you will see there very clear parallels, for example, with Milton's Paradise Lost. Now, Pullman's ideas are open to many lines of discussion, and I have no doubt they'll be developed further in these works that we hear he is going to be writing. One of the issues is this classic debate about whether human consciousness stands in opposition to our physical natures, or whether in some way it's an extension of our physical natures. But the predominant view today is that no kind of new, if I could use this phrase, metaphysical ingredients needed to be added to humanity to bring about our higher level functions. And certainly, um, you will find a number of philosophers being very interested in this idea. For example, Nancy Murphy, who's an American philosopher and theologian, developed what she calls non-reductive physicalism. And what she's talking about there really is a way of thinking about human beings which does not use um, spiritual or eternal or um, supernatural ways of thinking, but nevertheless recognizes there is something distinct about us which needs to be examined. So what is it that is so distinct about us? And here I think we come to a writing which I quite enjoy, is Jeanette Winterson, and this is from a book she wrote called Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, which I think is a wonderful title. But here, here's a quote from this book. I think it's really interesting, and I'm going to expand on it in a moment. We cannot, she writes, simply eat, sleep, hunt, and reproduce. We are meaning-seeking creatures. And she there is, in effect, summarizing, I think rather elegantly and neatly, one of the things that really has emerged in the last two decades in the field of psychology, which is this growing recognition that there is something about us as human beings which makes us seek for meaning. And actually, our understanding of what meaning is has a big impact on how we exist in our world. It is much easier to cope with life if you have a system of meaning. And some of you will have read Nietzsche's uh, book. Um, the German title is Gutz und Dämmerung, but the English title will be The Twilight of the Idols. And in this, Nietzsche says this, you can cope with just about any kind of how if you have a why. And the point he's making is that if you've got an intellectual framework which makes sense of things that are happening to you, it really does help you to cope with them. So I think this is unquestionably one of the things that makes us distinct as creatures. It, in effect, is about recognizing that we have ways of relating to the material order which differ from each one of us to another, but this idea of meaning is very much about the sense of how we fit into this bigger picture. Now, this is um, a psychologist talking about um, what we understand by meaning, but you might like to look at this because it, it, it's a sort of neutral, empirical description of what meaning is all about. It's not saying, here is what the right meaning of life is. It's more reflecting on what it is about meaning that is so important to human beings. And in this case, um, Michael McKenzie um, writes that meaning is about the extent to which people comprehend, make sense of, or see significance in their lives, accompanied by a degree to which they perceive themselves to have a purpose, mission, or overarching aim in life. And in saying that, as you can see, we came back to that, come back to that question. I began to raise at the beginning, there are multiple ways in which we can understand and relate to the physical order in which we find ourselves. One of the things about us as human beings is that we can determine how we understand our world and thus how we behave within it. 
And this quote, I think, is helping us to see that this really is something quite important. So there are lots of things that emerge from this. We don't really understand why we do this as human beings, but it just seems to be part of our basic makeup. We believe that there is some meaning to be found, and we try and find it. And certainly there are some um, philosophical systems which offer us big pictures of reality. You might think of uh, Marxism being a good example. But for many people, it's religion, which is perhaps the most obvious example of this big picture kind of thinking. There's Keith Yandel, who's a philosopher of religion. And again, he's highlighting that this, this idea of meaning really is important and arguing that it's integral to the whole idea of religion. Now, religion is a conceptual system that provides an interpretation of the world and the place of human beings in it, based on the kind of how life should be lived, given that interpretation, and expresses this interpretation and lifestyle in a set of rituals, institutions, and practices. But the really important bit is not so much the rituals, institutions, and practices, which are expressions of what really matters, but rather the whole idea of the interpretation of the world and the place of human beings within it. So, really, this highlights, I think, that there is something distinctive about us in that we ask these deep questions and believe that we might be able to find answers. And many of you will have read Ludwig Wittgenstein, who wrote at length on this topic, and one of his better quotes is this, I quote, we feel that even if all possible scientific questions can be answered, the problems of life still haven't been touched on at, at all. And the point I think he's making is that, that, that understanding how the universe works, which is what science helps us grasp so well, isn't really enough. It's not just about how things work. It's about what things mean. And this quote, I think, from Keith Yandel brings that point out quite clearly. But ladies and gentlemen, I've come to the end of this lecture and indeed to the end of this series of lectures. And what I've been trying to do in this series of lectures is open up what I hope you will feel are interesting questions um, and interesting people to help us begin to think about them. I think it's probably fair to say we haven't solved any of them. But, but, they are interesting. What I've been trying to do is give you food for thought that will allow you to take these questions further and hopefully uh, enjoy thinking about these more. Thank you. Thank you.